Hello there and welcome to this week's Granny's Garden. Now this week I'm going to introduce you to a wee little beastie with a heck of a lot of attitude, namely the Pine Processionary Caterpillar, which lives in trees like the ones behind me. I'm going to discuss its life cycle because it is very important to know its life cycle because each stage is dealt with in a different manner. I'm going to tell you what to do if your child comes in contact with it and what to do if your dog comes in contact because in both cases the consequences are not very nice. Now don't think for one moment that this problem is not going to affect you. It used to be contained within southern Europe and the north of Africa, but due to climate change and global warming, this wee beastie has been on an unstoppable march ever northwards. And now at present it covers the whole of Spain and in France it's reached the level of Paris. So it's only a question of time before it makes the jump to the UK. But in the UK it's not going to enter by the front door, it'll enter by the back door. Now what do I mean by this? In 2016, the UK Forestry Commission created a report, a contingency plan of how to deal with this beastie when it does arrive. Now, in actual fact, there was a transient population already in the UK in 1995, and it came in, as I said, through the back door. Because, due to reforestation, they brought in a whole shipment of Scots pine from Italy, and that shipment was infested. Luckily, the nursery spotted it, and it was dealt with. But if it's going to reach the UK, it's going to be through this method, through the back door. So when you do buy any type of pine tree from a nursery, give it a good look over to make sure it doesn't have any stowaways. Now, in actual fact, these caterpillars don't like any temperature above 25 degrees centigrade or below 5 degrees centigrade. So if they do become established in the UK, they're actually going to prefer your climate than our climate. But even if it hasn't reached the UK yet, According to the World Tourism Organization, Spain is the second most visited country in the world, with 83 million people hitting our shores every year, among which 2 million are Irish and 18 million are British. Now, you might not be having contact with it yet in the UK, but if you come on holidays, it is more than likely that you're going to come in contact with it here in Spain. Now, depending on the climate, the aerial larval part comes to an end sometime between February and June. And at that stage, a female leads a long line of up to 300 caterpillars in a head to tail line or procession, hence the name, down the tree to look for a nice soft spot to turn into a chrysalis. Now, from chrysalis to moth is roughly just about one month. And then they're on the wing from May until July, but each individual moth only lives for 24 hours, which is just enough time to release a pheromone, which attracts the male moth, they mate, then the female flies to the top of a pine tree or a suitable pine tree, and then lays at the very, very top or near the very, very top, 300 eggs in the form of a, like a cone, which really imitates a pine shoot, which is why it's very, very difficult to tell at the egg stage what's a pine shoot and what are eggs. So you've got to be really vigilant. The eggs hatch just one month later and the little caterpillars immediately start eating the soft pine shoots. They forage at night even at temperatures at freezing or just below freezing, but they do need the heat of the sun to aid digestion, so in the morning they return to their nest. Even the weakest winter sun rays, when they shine through these intricate little silken threads of the nest, are capable of raising the temperature inside the nest well above the outside temperature. So what is all the hullabaloo about? Well, let's talk first as gardeners. Caterpillars defoliate trees, which is very unsightly. And if enough nests are present, they can almost completely defoliate the tree. Now, if the tree is firmly established, it probably won't kill it, but it'll so weaken it that it leaves it open to other pests and diseases. So it can make an actual indirect kill. However, if the caterpillars infect a newly forested area and the trees are young, they stand no chance whatsoever and it's total devastation, a direct kill. Now, the second problem, leaving gardening to one side, is a lot more serious because it preys on the natural curiosity of children and dogs. I mean, let's face it, dogs can be so, so sweet, but they can be total idiots. And regarding kids, well, they're also total idiots. The problem are the urticarial setae, or the hairs that these caterpillars have. Now, between the fourth and the fifth instar stages, they are at their most dangerous. They're fully charged and they can wreak havoc. Now these caterpillars have two different types of hairs, the true hairs, which are the more visible ones, and the urticarial or rash forming hairs, which are the ones that get launched into outer space. Just to get this into context, a normal caterpillar has 60,000 of these rash forming hairs per square millimetre. That means in a normal sized caterpillar, you're going to get up to half a million of these hairs and in a larger caterpillar, up to one million of these hairs. That's a lot of toxic stuff floating around. 
Now when the caterpillar has reached its fifth stage and is fat enough, a female decides that it's now time to come down the tree and find a nice place to form a chrysalis. So she leads a procession down the tree and then along footpaths, along forest paths, along open countryside, even in your garden. And that attracts attention. 300 caterpillars head to tail moving in a line, I'll put it up on the screen now, attracts a lot of attention, both from children and from dogs. From adults as well, but hopefully they'll have more sense. So we all know what kids are like. Kids say, oh, what's that must touch? And a dog says, oh, what's that must sniff? Or even worse, must taste. Now these caterpillars, when they feel stressed or feel they're under attack, the first thing they do is contract those intersegmental muscles and launch into the air these little fine barbed hairs. Now, if it's a child, it usually affects the hands, the legs, or the face. And if it's a dog, unfortunately, because it sniffs things, it tends to affect the nose, the lips, the tongue, and worse still, if it's ingested, then you're talking about something very serious. Now, in the case of a child, they usually scream blue murder, so you're going to know that something's wrong. Don't let them put their hands into their eyes or into their mouth. And if you can, get them to warm water. Wash it off with warm water. Uh, the warm water seems to counteract the toxin and then get them as soon as possible to either a local healthcare centre or a hospital because they're going to need not only topical treatment but also systemic steroids. Okay, so either you or your child has come into contact. What can you do as a quick fix? Well, it's a handy thing to take some scotch tape or some sticky tape, whatever you want to call it, just around in your pocket. If it's wider, all the better. I'm just going to turn the camera around now so you can see how easy this fix is. Now, for the purpose of this video, we're going to imagine that my leg that's got trousers on now is bare skin and it's come into contact with the caterpillar hairs. So, quick fix. Scotch tape, put it over. Obviously, you don't touch it with your own hand. Pull it off, further up, and keep gluing like this over the affected area. You're still going to need medical attention, but a lot of those barbed hairs are going to be here on the sticky tape. The important thing is not to touch it. Fold it over without touching it, and then dispose of it. This is not a 100% quick fix, but it's certainly better than before. You will have removed a substantial amount of those barbed hair from the area without getting it ingrained in the skin, because if you do rub it with your hands, that's the worst. It gets really ingrained and it's almost impossible to get out. So once you've done this, then give a quick shower down with hot water, warm water, uh, to get as many hairs as possible off. And then, of course, do go to a health centre and do go to a doctor. Remember, especially with the case of children, don't let them rub their eyes and don't let them put their hands in their mouth. And it's absolutely freezing out here, so we're going to head off inside and continue the video inside. Now, I've just come in here to the fire because it's so darn cold outside, there's no point in being miserable. Now, regarding dogs, how do you know when your dog has come into contact with us? Well... It's going to be very, very obvious. Even if you haven't seen the dog come in contact with it, immediately its behavior is going to change. It's going to become super agitated. It's going to start shaking its head, rubbing its head along the ground to try and get rid of the itching or burning sensation. It's going to start hyper salivating and it's going to start panting because it's so stressed out. Now, this is important. This is a medical emergency. You cannot wait with the dog. It's not the same as a child touching it because one thing is to have it on the paws or on the hands. And another thing is to have it inside the mouth, on the lips or the nose. Immediately the part that's come in contact with the hairs are going to start becoming inflamed and the lips can become inflamed and the tongue can become inflamed and it's got to be halted. Its progress has got to be halted by a vet with steroids. If you wait too long before taking your animal to the vet, then the parts that came in contact with the hairs are going to start getting, losing color, become like a yellowy, a yellowy gray color and these will eventually turn black and this is necrosis and those, those elements are going to die. Now, once the change in colour has started, even if you take it to a vet, you can't undo the damage done up to that point, but you can stop the damage progressing. So as you can see, contact with this wee beastie can have serious consequences both for your children and for your dogs. So you can see how as gardeners we need to deal with this and get rid of them. Now, always, as with any type of uh, problem, I would always suggest natural predators, but unfortunately in this case there aren't that many natural predators. In its moth stage, which only lasts 24 hours, and it is nocturnal. Bats love them, but there's only a certain amount of moths that a bat can eat. In the chrysalis stage, a hoopoe bird or a magpie will certainly eat the chrysalis if it can find it. But in its caterpillar stage, there's damn few animals that want to even get close to it. As regards garden birds, some members of the tit family 
do take them on. The great tit, the crested tit and the cold tit will certainly take them on as caterpillars. Now these tits along with uh, the cuckoo have developed a special gizzard wall structure to enable them to be able to eat the caterpillar hairs without falling foul to the hairs. Now I talked about earlier how important it is to know what stages the caterpillar goes through to know how to deal with them. Now in instars or stages one, two and three, you can use BT as a spray and it's very effective. If you have a pine tree in your garden and you know for a fact that there are processionaries present out, even if it's in the countryside or other people's gardens, spray the tree anyway in September, October, which is when they're in these phases one, two and three. However, for stages four and five, it's no use at all. So you need to take other methods. Now, after stage three, you need mechanical removal. Now, I had two nests in my pine tree this year. I spotted them from the upstairs window and we got a ladder up and we took them down. Now, if you don't know what you're doing, don't touch the nests. Because the pine processionary caterpillar is present in Spain, there are many specialist companies that do it or many specialist gardening companies that know how to get rid of the nest. So what we did was put a ladder up, you cut down either the top of the branch or the nest. You do not touch it because the nest itself is full of hairs. It's important for you to wear goggles, a mask and gloves and long sleeves. It's important to do it during the daytime and not getting up towards nighttime because these things come out of the nest at night. So you need to get it during the daytime when they're asleep and doing their digestion. As soon as you get them on the ground, you either put a rubbish bag around it, tie it tightly and then get it away from the property. Or what you really should do and what any vet would advise you to do is put it on the ground, put an accelerant on top of it like uh, alcohol, 96 degree alcohol. It must be an accelerant and then create a fireball. Put a match to it, put a clicker to it and it will explode into flames. And if that explosion will make sure that any hairs launched get singed before they have time to do any damage. I've got rid of the nest for this year. But nothing's to say that in a few months time a new adult moth can come along, land once again on my same uh, pine tree in my garden and hatch another 300 eggs or lay another 300 eggs which will hatch out and the problem begins all over again. So I need to set traps and traps are done in two different ways. Now this is one of the traps. It looks on first sight like as if it's like a wasp trap but obviously it's not because each of the moths only lasts for 24 hours and they don't even have a digestive system. So there's no point in putting sweet nectar-like things because they're not going to be attracted to it. However, as stated previously in the video, the male moths are attracted to pheromones. So this is a pheromone trap. And when it's mounted, a pheromone in this syringe is injected into a little basket, which goes underneath here. The moth is attracted, flies in here, flies down through the hole and gets trapped in here. The idea behind this is if the male moth is trapped, it can't fertilize the female, it can't mate with the female, and therefore you're going to have less eggs for the following season. And this you hang on your tree from May onwards. You can take it down probably, say, end of September, and the following year you can reuse it. All you need to do is get some more refills, because these are sold separately, you can get refills. Now, this is the second trap, and I need in my area to have this up by mid-February. But the, the idea is the following. This foam goes around the circumference of the trunk of the tree. And then it sticks to the collar. It's written into the DNA of these caterpillars that they have to move ever downwards. So they move down the trunk of the tree and hit this solid block between the trunk and the collar. And they don't, curiously enough, they don't think of coming back up over and going down and continuing their route downwards. No. They start going round and round and round, searching for a way down. And there's a little hole which leads straight into this plastic bag. Then when the time comes, they'll be caught here in the base of this plastic bag. All you do is fold it down and get rid of it, and without ever having to touch either the caterpillar or the hairs. Very simple, but very effective. So we're going to head off now into the garden and set up this trap on the pine tree. And we're going to reserve this, as I said, for later, from the month of May onwards. But this one has got to be installed this week. This is the instruction leaflet. And I can say possibly that they are the very, very worst instruction seats we have ever seen in our entire life. So much so that we consider putting in their website that they go on a training course to IKEA to learn how to write an instruction manual. Because this is a load of rubbish. It's complex. 
it's incomplete and the photos don't correspond to what's in the packet. Now the first thing you do is scout around the pine tree and collect up what you'd normally find at the base of a pine tree, these old pine needles etc. And you put it inside the trap or inside the plastic bag. As I showed you on the coffee table, this is the clear collar. Underneath here is the foam and this is just to attach it to the tree. The idea is it come down the trunk of the tree and go inside here. They're not ever going to come up and over the side, or that's the general idea. They keep going round until they find a hole. And this hole is here, it's like a chute. They go inside that chute, which goes inside the bag. And once they're down inside the bag, they can't get out again. Now, once you reach the month of June, all of this can come off. And if you've trapped anything in it, just dispose of it. And remember, then in the month of May, I've got to hang a, a male trap. But that's not very unsightly. This, on the other hand, is quite unsightly, but is, is very, very necessary. Now, if you are visiting Spain or you're an expat and you're living in Spain, have a look at the tree trunks of some of the pine trees in your area. If you see a round green circle, don't think, oh, they must be marking it because they're going to chop it down. No, it means that you're in an area that is infected and that pine tree has got a trap on it. Spain is lovely and we want you coming away with a tan maybe a bit of sunburn, but certainly not a rash, because these rashes can last for weeks. It's weeks of pain and itching, so it's not worth it. Keep your eye out and react. Remember, don't rub ever. All it does is make it more ingrained into the skin. Water, warm water if possible, medical attention. So next week I'll be back, so don't forget to subscribe, with things that are less creepy crawly, definitely things that are less itchy, and I'd like you to join me next Friday here in Granny's Garden. So from me, for the moment, it's bye-bye now.